Well, let's say it happened to me. Mm -hmm. A little different. I didn't know how to do anything. Let's get clear about that. I was moved through the different pranayamas and actually they did themselves to me or the Kundalini led, you know, did it to me. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, the best place to shop for unique clothing, spiritual handcrafted jewelry, healing gemstones, and fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now, here's your host, Brett Larkin. Hello, Savannah family. Welcome back. Thank you for being here, for listening, and for all the love you give the show. Today, we're demystifying Shaktipat, which is the transmission of Kundalini energy from teacher to student. Here to speak with us about this today is Gabriel Cousins. He is the author of 14 internationally acclaimed books. He's known worldwide as a spiritual teacher and the leading expert in live plant source nutrition. Nutrition. He's a holistic physician, psychiatrist, family therapist, and cutting edge researcher on healing diabetes naturally. He holds an MD from Columbia Medical School, a doctorate in homeopathy, and diplomas in Ayurveda, clinical acupuncture, and holistic medicine. He's an ordained rabbi, an acknowledged yogi, and a four year Native American sun dancer. So he's going to be speaking to us about his Kundalini awakening as well. We'll be covering what is is Shaktipat. What role does it play in the process of liberation and how is it transmitted from teacher to student? If awakening kundalini energy or having a big kundalini awakening is something you're interested in, something you seek, do not miss this week's episode. Our guest knowledge on the topic of kundalini energy is vast, so get ready to be inspired. Before we dive in, I just want to remind you of how you can support the show, how you can keep these interviews coming to you. The first way is to leave a rating or review here on iTunes, even if iTunes isn't how you normally listen to the show. And the second way is to make a purchase on savannaspirit.com. If you meditate, Savannah Spirit has everything you need to enhance your meditation practice. Some of the products that I love are the mala beads, the singing bowls. There's also statues and incense that you can purchase to make your space truly sacred and of course also support the podcast as well. Use the discount code podcast30 for 30% off your first order. And now let's dive in to this week's conversation. Gabriel, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for, for joining us. I think the best way for us to start our conversation is to talk about what Shakti Pot is. What does it have to do with awakening and transcendence? I think there's a lot of confusion around what Shakti Pot means. What it what is it that it is and what is it that you're doing? Well, Brett, that's a really good question. So Shakti Pot is a tradition that goes back to the time of Shiva, eight thousand years ago. And just in case people don't know it, Shiva was a real person. He was probably the first animal rights uh, uh, leader in the world or in history. And he started the whole tradition, which is uh, the key to my yoga tradition. So it goes back 8,000 years, the best we can tell. What is it? It's the transmission of the awakening energy uh, from generation to generation. That's kind of an overview. Now, to be more specific, uh, because things have changed now. So then it was the guru touches the chief disciple, and they now carry the energy. It's been passed on. And the truth is, it's in every tradition. As I write my book, uh, uh, Spiritual Nutrition uh, and the Rainbow Diet uh, and Liberation, it, it... you can find this uh, transmission of energy in almost every tradition. So it's the transmission of energy from a teacher to a student. Is that a simple way to look at it? It's a simple way. And it's in the context I'm talking about, we are talking all the way back to, to the, the actual living person called Shiva, you know, and that transmission over 8,000 years. Now, what does it do? Well, In the context I'm talking about, it is about the awakening of the kundalini energy. So one way I like to talk about is it is the descent of grace. 
that awakens the kundalini energy. The awakening of the kundalini energy is considered the next, and I'm going to say the final step in the liberation process. So uh, some of the great teachers like uh, Rama, uh, Ramana, uh, Rama Krishna, for example, said, it's only when the kundalini is awakened, I'm paraphrasing, is when the spiritual life begins. Muktananda, who was my guru, said the same thing, approximately the same thing. So it's an understanding that we can do yoga, uh, you know, the, the yoga asana, we can do pranayama, we can do different things, but only when this energy is awakened does the uh, final phase of the spiritual path to enlightenment begin. So that's the context. Uh, and it's a it's important context to understand. Uh, then the other other part of that uh, is that there's a whole unfolding process. Now I was very blessed to receive this awakening energy from Swami Muktananda in 1975, and I'll, I'll give you a little feeling for what happened because then you can understand the power of it. There are probably 2,000 people in the room. Quite frankly, I didn't know much about the whole tradition, but I, um, I've i been studying Kundalini a little bit, and, and I met with Swami McDonald. He said, you should come to intensive, then you'll understand. So when he came to me, he actually blew into my mouth, and his physical prana went into me. Now, I'm going to footnote and say Shakti Pak can be transmitted by look, by touch, which is what most people think about, and by breath and actually by sound. And I literally give, I, I have been directed by Muktananda to be a vehicle for the Shakti Pad. So I will give it over the video to students in Brazil, for example, and they'll have Kundalini awakenings just by, by look, by eyes, actually is what we're talking about. It's, it's the eyes and also uh, by sound. So you have the four different ways. So he blew into my mouth, and it's like, that was a surprise. Nobody told me that was going to happen. And Gabriel, did he do this during a meditation? Were you seated in meditation when this happened? Yes, I'm sorry. We were okay. all sitting for an hour meditation, and he was going around giving the touch, which is the usual way he, he would do it. And what does the touch uh, look like? Can you describe that for people? Perfect. Good question. It, it, for him, it was two ways. It, at the beginning stages before there were thousands of people, he would actually physically touch you, uh, usually in the third eye area, okay? Uh, later, he began using peacock feathers to touch people because there was just so many people. So that's the true, you know, the usual way he did it. Now, the breath, that's a, a rarity, and I had no idea that was going to happen, but he blew his prana more directly into me. And I could feel the energy going down, and then it reached the base of my uh, spine uh, where the basically the kundalini is stored uh, in a, in a, below the base chakra. Um, I'm not going to get too technical for people, but below the base uh, chakra. And it, there was just this explosion. And then it began to move throughout my whole body, activating all the chakras. Now, when I mean activating, I literally saw, and I didn't know this prior. This is important. I, I saw all the petals of all the different chakras. It's like, what is this? And each chakra has a, a different set of petals. And so I saw it, and I also saw the energies associated with each petal. And then as it began to move up, it came to the third eye and, and then kind of exploded in the crown chakra and kind of went above me. And then suddenly this other figure appeared, which was turned out, which I didn't know, was his guru, Nityananda. And as he looked down at me, and this is another piece, you can receive Shaktipat from uh, um, people who have already left their bodies. So he looked down at me, then I had another explosion of energy, uh, and um, my whole crown chakra lit up. And again, Footnote, I was very new at all this. Like, this is way beyond my imagination, okay? And 
with each chakra, there's a certain amount of consciousness that was released. For me, I had another question. Uh, in my life, I, uh, a lot of people in my family died, and I would was looking for the answer of what this is all about, death. And somewhere in that process, a little voice rang out and said, there is no death for the self. And that answered my questions that I had as a, you know, as a teenager, as a 16-year-old, uh, when my older brother was killed in a car accident. It's like, oh, there's no death for the self. And that was what I call an apperception, not an intellectual understanding. So I'm sharing another piece is that many deep understandings come once the Kundalini is awakening. And, and that's a, important. It isn't just you have this experience, uh, but... Uh, your levels of consciousness are awakened. Now, on the external plane, um, I developed a rash, uh, lasted two weeks, that literally went from the base of my spine, went back and forth across my spine like a serpent, uh, ending in the left side of my neck. And both hands became red and blistered. So there's a lot of heat with Kundalini too because it's opening you up to the cosmic energetic flow. And uh, for me, it was pushing me to my very limits of what energy I can hold. And so this, as I said, this, which uh, my friend, Lee Sinel, Dr. Lee Sinello wrote the book, Kundalini and Transcendence. He said that was just clear stigmata. So in the Christian world, we talk about the, 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 you know, the, the stigma that people have. I was experiencing stigmata. So this is just an idea of, of what goes on with the Kundalini. And it is fire, okay? It get, it get, it's very hot. It can be. So that that was the, the initial, okay? So I had outer stigmata, and I had inner uh, experiences really receiving uh, the, the kind of mystical understandings of each chakra and literally, as I say, seeing the petals. And it it was a little uh, uh, subtle because at the heart chakra, I saw eight petals. And later I looked up and there, I said, there should be 12 petals. What happened here? And then looked up further and that there is a, normally the 12 petals, but inside the 12 petals are the eight mystical petals. So what I'm saying is real mystical understanding of who we are on a subtle plane is revealed to people. That's, uh, I think, that the most important thing to kind of understand what I'm saying here. So this one Shaktipat where he blew his prana into me awakened on multiple levels with multiple, in a sense, you know, mystical insights to stigmata going the full length of my spine. So that was a more than a, it was a very full awakening. So that gives you an idea, a little bit of what can happen. And then it continued. I, two weeks later, I received Shaktipat again, and I didn't have any experience with pranayama. I spent one hour in intensive pranayama doing every single pranayama that I've since learned about, naturally and spontaneously without any prior knowledge. And that's a little bit where I began to understand that the practices of pranayama and really yoga asana may have come, this is just a theory, just a theory, actually coming from people who've had their kundalini awaken, and it can awaken spontaneously uh, from years of meditation and so forth. Uh, the easiest way is shaktipat, which is the descent of grace from another person to yourself. Um, it can also, women at birth, actually, I have a few cases, or at least one or two cases of women having a kundalini awakening, giving birth. There are different things, but classically speaking, it's by look, by touch, by sound, and by breath. So all this is, as I say, going on, and I'm led through all the pranayamas that you can possibly imagine, way more than I even knew about. I didn't know about any to begin with. And I also had what I can call a, a certain amount of Kriyavati where I was moved through, and this is like there's thousands of people, but uh, other people, they're all in meditation, 
uh, where you move through certain yoga asanas. So my theory is it's possible when people have the Kundalini awakened spontaneously or through a uh, through their guru, uh, spiritual teacher, you know, thousands of years ago, um, they spontaneously went through a variety of uh, yoga asanas, which are designed to actually help awaken the Kundalini. And well, I'm going to say differently, designed to help move the flow of the Kundalini. So you move into certain positions that uh, accelerate the unfolding and opening up the channels. Uh, technically, we talk about 72,000 nadis, which are the subtle channels. And again, I don't want to get too technical here, but three main ones, Ida Pangala and Shushumna. And so the yoga asanas uh, come, come spontaneously to move the energy through the 72,000 nadis and particularly the, the main three. So then people saw that, again, this is my theory, and then began copying it, hoping that if they copied it, then they would have the Kundalini awakened. So what you're saying is the people who were originally doing the asanas in your, in your theory were people who were awakened, and that was just the, the energy spontaneously moving through them. Exactly, which we call Kriyavadi, which is, uh, 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 is what happens, you know. I was moved through some, other people were moved through other uh, yoga asanas. I was moved through all the, you know, every possible pranayama we can possibly think of that I've researched up. And it was all spontaneous. Right. So it wasn't like he said, okay, this is how you do alternate nostril breathing. It was just a transmission. You just knew how to do all these pranayama techniques immediately and you were just doing Well, them. let's say it happened to me. Mm -hmm. A little different. I didn't know how to do anything. Let's get clear about that. I was moved through the different pranayamas and actually they did themselves to me or the Kundalini led, you know, did it to me. Do you see what, what I'm saying? It's I do. I do. And Gabriel, what was your relationship with your teacher at this, at this point? Were you and he talking? I met him once. You didn't know him at all. I, I really had no um, personal relationship whatsoever with him. Yes, I, I met him. And he said, yes, you want to learn about it, come to an intensive. So I actually didn't know much about him or anything. Uh, except. And were you asking him questions and talking about what happened? I was just saying, did you ask him questions? Were you guys talking about what happened or not? No. No, no. Remember, there's a room with maybe two, at least a thousand people. Right. <laughs> One of the people there. And he did what he did. Now, on the other side of it, I have a little feeling how it works in that when I'm uh, involving the transmission of this energy uh, based on his direction, um, I just kind of flow and I do whatever I'm guided to do. So I don't think he was thinking about it per se, but I'm guided to do this or do that or touch here or touch the top of the head or do you follow what I'm saying? So the, the Kundalini is moving, the cosmic Kundalini, and I'll explain a little bit more about Kundalini in a moment. And you are, being that person, are literally guided to uh, help awaken it in people in different ways. And uh, basically, it's touching the forehead, but it's a, it could be, you know, touching the back of the head. It could, you know, simple things. It could be doing the breath, as I mentioned, but you're just simply guided. And so... For me, uh, the cosmic energy is running through, and I'm just guided to where it goes. And I'm just the, the tool at the end of the line uh, to it's how it's flowing. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It does. And I think this is a big question for people listening. Because, for example, and I, again, I feel like on the show I always just use myself as an example. But I might do, right now I'm doing a 40-day Kriya, right? To um, It actually is focused on Kundalini awakening, this particular sequence. So I'm doing this work on my own as a solo yoga practitioner, right? Now, at what point, so I guess my question is, A... For someone who's doing, whether it's kundalini yoga or a certain type of meditation at home that's, again, designed to awaken kundalini energy, that's why they're doing it. it is it really working or do they need someone to do shakti pot in order to have an awakening? Because, for example, when I do this kriya in the morning, I obviously feel way better after I did it than before. It ends with a third eye meditation and I, you know, I feel great. But it's not the kind of 
experience that you just described, right? Which was with the stigmata and, you know, all this heat and, you know, it was much, much subtler. So for those of us that are practicing at home or are doing some things, you know, we think we're, we're raising Kundalini energy at home through doing yoga. A, are we? Like, are, are we actually raising Kundalini? And B, do we actually need to take this step of getting involved with the teacher to get a transmission if we want to experience this for real? I hope my question makes sense. Your question makes total sense. <clears throat> Mostly using it to yoga sauna hasn't proven to be very successful. The uh, I started that uh, with Dr. Lee Snow, the Kundalini Crisis Clinic. And it clearly would awaken spontaneously in people. And the main people who are coming uh, were people who actually are very, very heavy meditators. And uh, actually... I don't remember anyone who's just doing yoga asana. Okay, so people were meditating hours a day. They're the ones that are more likely to have the spontaneous awakening. It's still on the rare side. It can still happen. As I said, it can happen at birth if you, you know, uh, have a case of a person actually a brick fell on his head. Okay, that, but these are rare and unusual. Uh, there isn't a regular basis. Uh, in the level I'm talking about for the Kundalini, uh, let's say spontaneously awakened with um, yoga asana practices and pranayama. You can raise the energy, absolutely. You do yoga asana, raise the energy. I do pranayama every day. My wife and I do it together. It raises the energy, you know, it's good, but we're not talking that. We're, you know, Kundalini awakens very, very different. It takes you, as Carl Jung said, uh, into a universe out of your control. It takes you uh, to a place of, of, of awakening that's beyond the imagination. So get, raising, you know, activating your energy through uh, pranayam, which is a little bit more classical way with that. Uh, these mechanical ways can certainly heat you up. They can certainly, you know, move the energy. But we are not talking about kundalini awakening. This is really not the same. Can it happen? Yeah. Again, my experience over the years, and that's 45 years of doing this, you know, uh, is really it's the people doing uh, intense hours of meditation, four to six hours a day of meditation that we see, I see that more spontaneous awakening. So that's what I want to say. Now, I don't want to discourage anybody because I think it's great that you're doing these things because, and it's good. And that desire is, is really, really important in the process. But generally speaking, the classic easiest and safest, I want to use the word safest, is um, getting the classical Shakti pot. Now, do you have to have a relationship with the teacher? Well, no. No, that may sound, it's not good for the guru business, right? But the truth is, the answer is no. I, did, I barely knew Muktana. You know, he just said, come, okay? Um I've given Shakti Bhatt to as many as 4,000 people at once and once in Brazil and all kinds of people I never met. They had lots of, you know, classic Kundalini awakening, okay? I don't know anybody. I'm just this energy conduit that has been given task by my guru to do the work. I have to show up and do the work. And so do you follow what I'm saying? But I don't have... I don't have to know people. So when I do a, a meditation, you know, Shaktipat meditation, people are welcome. And I do come about twice a year to the Bay Area because I have my son and my granddaughter there and so forth, Petaluma. But there's no there's no prerequisite. Does, does that make sense what I'm saying? It does. And I guess I'm curious for people who've come to those events, is it a guarantee that they're going to feel something. For example, when you had this experience in a room with a thousand people, when you had your transmission, you know, were the people on the left and right of you experiencing something similar or the exact same thing? Or is everyone going to experience this differently? Or if the teacher, you know, is initiating to a large group of people, is it sort of like only the people in the group who are ready for the awakening will experience? It's an excellent question. In my experience over the years, it's only the people who are ready, okay? Let's say, I'll put it this way. Let's say you need eight units to have the awakening of the Kundalini to go to 10 units. Well, if you're at six, well, you need to be doing your pranayama and your meditating and your yoga sun and things, and you're building up that understanding. So it's only when you're at eight units, let's say, 
are you ready to have it awaken? So there are many people who don't have it awaken. That's what it is. But every time you go, you're increasing your energy for that potential to happen. And that's great because that makes sense for those of us that are practicing at home that we're laying that foundation. We're, you know, adding up the units to to experience this eventually. Right. So the key is, and this is what I really share with people, enjoy what you're doing. Don't have a goal. Classic kind of karma yoga action without expectation of return. Just enjoy it. Love the lifestyle. And when it's ready, you'll be guided to the right situation for that to awaken. Well, I love that you use the word goal because in speaking with you, I've been thinking about the yoga sutras a little bit and Patanjali talking about how kind of the goal or aim of yoga, right, is to reach this state of samadhi. Now, I don't know if I'm mixing philosophies here, but I think people are often curious about this. Like, is a state of samadhi, like to get to a state of samadhi, is a kundalini awakening required or are these two completely separate things? Well... It's a question I can't um, fully answer, but, you know, yoga chitta vritti naroda ha. Yoga is quieting the activities of the mind, right? That's what Patanjali said. Now, I think the key is when you quiet your mind, who knows what's going to happen next, but samadhi is there, and I don't think your kundalini has to be awakened for that. That's my impression. Um, Now, the states of samadhi I'm talking about is beyond a quiet mind. Because see, Patanjali in that sutra isn't talking about going beyond the mind. That's still within the mind. Am I being clear what I'm saying here? No, this is really interesting. Samadhi is that quieting of the mind. It's He's not- saying yoga chutti vritti nurodaha, the goal of yoga is to quiet the mind. That's goal one. The next part of it is to go beyond the mind. That's where what I talk about samadhi is, is happening. Uh, uh, and there's two kinds of samadhis, um, sankalpa samadhi and nirkalpa samadhi. And what does that mean? Sankalpa is when you merge into the white light and you disappear. Okay, you're gone. Well, there's a little idea of the um, I am this left, but you're... And nirvikalpa is when you uh, merge into the void. Okay, so I'm giving you two, and it's the blackness. So those are two levels. They kind of happen beyond the mind because there's still, there's really no you left. And the you I'm talking about is the individual identity of yourself, your own unique I amness. That's still the mind, okay? So, so let me give you an example of fairly extreme nirvikalpa samadhi. So I'm meditating in India and this energy kind of overtakes me. And this is way after the Kundalini is awakened. And I not only merge into the void, that's step one, but I disappear. Not only do I disappear, I stop breathing. And um, how do I know? Because my wife came in and noticed she thought I died. Okay. But she wouldn't let anybody touch me because she also had an idea. Well, he was doing it when he was meditating. Who knows? So I am gone for 40 minutes. I don't, I mean, I'm not breathing uh, in a visible way for 40 minutes, and then I come out of that, out of the nothing. So the deepest my is there's no you. I'm giving a little bit deeper understanding of these things, which is way different than a quiet mind where you're aware of a quiet mind, which is the yoga, chirti, virti, nirodha, step one. You follow what I'm saying here? And yeah. and, and same with a, a sankalpa samadhi, you're merging into the white light. That, Nerva couple is, is deeper. Um, and you disappear into it. That's beyond the mind. And so I'm, I'm defining it a little bit um, deeper in, into that. And um, there's another samadhi, which is the enlightenment samadhi, which is uh, sahaja samadhi, which is you're, you're walking around with that awareness all the time. And uh, that's after that's more the enlightenment state where that exists within you and you are aware and you're, you're aware of nothing. So you're still beyond the mind, even though you're in the body sounds paradoxical, but a lot of the enlightenment path liberation path is, is paradoxical in a certain way. So there are three levels, but Sahaja Samadhi is like uh, the Samadhi while walking around. It's another state, but I want to just to give you just so we're full in this discussion. So we have, Sankapa Samai, Nirvakapa Samai, which are your 
classical kind of samadhis that but i'm saying they're beyond the quiet mind because you disappear you die into the nothing and uh that's that's a uh a kind of, I think, a little clear. I hope that's a clearer uh, explanation for what I believe um, he was talking about, and I believe he knew those states, but he was perhaps talking about the first level, first step when he said Yoga Chirti Chirti Nuradha. I mean, Patanjali, mm-hmm. as far as I can tell, was was a, a you know, really great enlightened being. Savannah family, make sure to tune in on Thursday where this conversation with Gabriel Cousins will continue. We have so much more to discuss. We'll be talking about how once you experience a kundalini awakening, how it actually unfolds throughout your system and through the higher chakras. We're going to learn about how this energy can thrive or die depending on how we choose to nurture it. And we're also going to deep dive into the relationship between teacher and student. Is it possible to experience a kundalini awakening without the guidance of a spiritual teacher or is energy transmission from a teacher really necessary and what are the red flags that we should be aware of when looking to receive shaktipat how do we find the right teacher all of that is coming up when this conversation is continued on thursday make sure to tune in then for now from my heart to yours thank you for being here for listening and namaste You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.